Hey everybody, welcome back. This video is all about Congress, so let's get right to it. All right, welcome back. So we're gonna get right into Congress, so we start with the beginning. Article one in the Constitution tells us all about the legislative branch, and specifically, Article one, section eight, gives us the powers of Congress. Now, as we talked about in the previous video, we already know that there are two different types of powers Congress has enumerated or expressed powers that are directly stated in the Constitution, those that are listed in Article 1, Section 8. And according to Article 1, Section 8, Congress has certain enumerated powers, things like declaring war, raising an army, taxing, raising revenue, passing a budget, spending money, coining money, borrowing money, a whole bunch of stuff to do with money. But those are some of the enumerated or expressed powers of Congress. And there are also implied powers. These come from the Necessary and Proper Clause and allow Congress to make more legislation on a wide variety of things, even though they aren't directly mentioned in the Constitution specifically. So this allows Congress to make legislation on things like economic, environmental, and social issues. Now, we also know that we have a bicameral legislature made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. So let's talk about each one of these. So let's start with the House of Representatives. The House has 435 members. We know that the members represent districts, and by the way, that the House is based off of population. Each member serves a two-year term, so they are constantly up for re-election, and the House is in general just more formal with stricter rules than the Senate. The Senate, on the other hand, has 100 members, that's two per state, and originally they were seen as representing states, although with the 17th Amendment that has kind of changed because now they are also directly elected, just like members of the House are. Senators serve six-year terms, and the Senate is less formal with fewer rules than the House. So that's a good intro into some of the differences between the House and the Senate, but let's go a little bit deeper. In fact, let's go a lot deeper into the specific roles of each of the House and the Senate. So again, let's start with the House. Okay, so the House has the power to initiate all tax and revenue bills. So if you're getting taxed, or if the government is spending money, then that needs to start in the House. So that's a pretty significant power there. Additionally, the House has the power of impeachment, or has a rules committee, can form itself into a committee of the whole, and members can use something called a discharge petition. So let's talk about each of those with a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's start with impeachment. The House has the power to impeach. That means that they have the power to charge somebody, be it president, federal judge, etc., with a crime, and it just takes a simple majority vote in order to have those articles of impeachment invoked. Then the Senate holds the impeachment trial. And here, there's a much higher bar of two-thirds that's necessary in order to actually convict and to remove somebody from office. The House also has the power to form itself into a committee of the whole, and they do this often to expedite the passage of legislation. So the House here is able to basically just function and act like a committee, where they would debate, they propose amendments, changes to the bill, they can edit, they can revise, but instead of this being done in a small committee, it's now done on the House floor, so they can do this. Again, usually this is done to try to speed up passage of legislation. The House can also make use of a discharge petition. What this is, it's a majority vote that would force a bill that's stuck in committee out of that committee and to the House floor, where then any member can now discuss, they can debate, they can edit, they can revise, they can ultimately vote on that bill, and it can possibly even pass. Now, this is rarely used, but it is one of those things we want to know as another way that we can kind of speed up the legislative process. And our last main difference was that the House has something known as a Rules Committee. And this is an extra step in the legislative process that only occurs in the House. So once the bill has gotten out of the committee process, it now goes to the Rules Committee, where they then set the rules for debate and for votes. So they can decide whether or not amendments will be allowed to be added or to be proposed. They'll be able to discuss or to set the rules on the time limits and discussion, and those sorts of things. And ultimately, they can set rules that make it easier or tougher for a bill to pass. All right, so now let's turn our attention to the Senate. The Senate has confirmation power. So this in the Constitution is known as advice and consent. So they can confirm nominations. This is for sometimes heads of executive agencies, definitely for federal judges. The Senate also has the power to ratify treaties. They hold the impeachment trial, as we discussed earlier. And then there's some things we'll discuss in more detail momentarily, such as the filibuster and holds and unanimous consent agreements. Okay, so let's talk about the filibuster. Everybody has an opinion on the filibuster. Sometimes people want it to go away and be gone forever. Other people defend it and say, no, this is something we need. So what is it? Well, the filibuster was a long speech that's designed to delay action and prevent a bill from being voted upon. 
Now, this isn't a long speech so that you can convince other people. Rather, again, its intention is to prevent that bill from being voted upon. Now, the reason that you would filibuster is because you know if the bill comes to a vote that it's going to pass. Because remember, you only need a simple majority to pass a bill in the House and the Senate. So to stop that bill from being passed, what you need to do is prevent it from being voted on. Now, the way that you forcibly end a filibuster is that you have to have something called a cloture motion. And this requires a three-fifths majority in the Senate. So you might see the disconnect here. It only takes a simple majority, which is 51, to pass the bill, but it requires 60 members to end filibusters, which would then allow the vote to take place. So what happens if a bill has the support of, let's say, 52 or 53 members? Well, with the filibuster, probably nothing. That bill probably won't ever come to a vote because they don't have enough support to end a filibuster forcibly. But you might be wondering, well, okay, but you said it was a long speech and a person can only speak for so long, even if they team up, like they're not gonna do this for everything. And that's why it's important to point out something known as the silent filibuster. The idea is that now senators really only need to signal their intention to filibuster or their willingness to filibuster and it's acknowledged that a filibuster is taking place even though that person isn't actually standing up and speaking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, why do they do this? There were a series of very long filibusters. We're talking upwards of 50 to 60 days worth of filibusters. And while that was going on, nothing else could be done because the Senate floor was taken by a group of senators who were just talking all the time, right? Preventing a bill from being voted on. So they come up with the silent filibuster, which says, okay, we acknowledge that a filibuster is taking place, but we're going to work on other things while that's going on. And that sounds really good in theory. The problem is it makes it very, very easy to filibuster. And so we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of filibusters in recent decades. That also means it's a lot more difficult to pass legislation. And this is why oftentimes it's the majority party who is usually the one that's kind of arguing in favor of getting rid of the filibuster because this is a powerful tactic by the minority party in the Senate to prevent legislation that they dislike, or at least make the majority party have to negotiate and compromise with them. Holds are functioning the same thing as a silent filibuster. Basically, the senator can say, um, I want to be informed before this bill is voted upon, I need more information, and they can prevent it from being discussed on the floor until they release their hold. And a hold is ended the same way as a filibuster through that cloture vote, which then cuts off all debate and schedules a vote within 48 hours. So both of those make it a lot tougher for legislation to pass, but the Senate does have something that's the opposite, unanimous consent agreements, and these would kind of speed through legislation. Basically, they set the terms for floor debate, and that might include time limits, uh, rules on amendments. Again, that word though, unanimous. So this is something that everybody's agreeing to. So this is typically for things that are more procedural, things that are more formal and not really uh, up for debate. Now, political parties matter in Congress. In fact, congressional leadership is based on political parties. So we think of things like the Speaker of the House being the leader of the House of Representatives, always from the majority party. The Senate, they have a majority leader, again, from the majority party. Both the House and the Senate make use of a minority leader, so they lead the opposition or the minority party. Both the House and the Senate and both the majority and minority parties have people designated as the party whip, and they try to keep people voting with their party, maintain party loyalty and votes within Congress. In the Senate, we have somebody known as the president of the Senate, and that is your vice president. The only time that he or she is actually important in the Senate is if there is a tie, because then it is the job of the vice president to cast a tie-breaking vote. Now, as this video is published in 2021, the Senate currently sits 50-50, and so Vice President Kamala Harris has an important role casting a large number of tie-breaking votes because of the 50-50 split in the Senate. Well, how does Congress actually make and eventually pass legislation? Well, the vast majority of the work is done in committees. In fact, specifically, it's done in standing committees. These are the most important type of committee. Bills are sent here first, so once they are written, they go right to a standing committee. The job of the standing committee is to edit, to revise, to mark up the bills. The committee will hold hearings where they will then try to gather information and hear from proponents and opponents of the bill. Once the bill has actually been passed and become a law, that standing committee will then in the future conduct congressional oversight, investigating the executive branch, the bureaucratic agencies, making sure that that law is being enforced as Congress intended. So there is an, quite an important role for standing committees here. 
Now, another type of important committee is known as a conference committee. And the role of a conference committee is, well, what if the House passes one version of a bill and the Senate's version is different, it's not the same? Well, then what they do is they form a conference committee with members of both the House and the Senate. They come together and they try to make a compromised version of that bill so that the House and Senate can pass the same bill. Because the president can't sign a bill that's been passed in different versions, it needs to be the exact same bill from both the House and the Senate. Okay, so we know that Congress has the power of the purse and so they spend money, but let's get into again some more detail on that. So they pass something known as pork barrel legislation, and these are laws that provide tangible benefits, jobs, money to a district. These are things that members of the House specifically try to obtain so they can kind of come back to their district and be like, look what I did for us. I got this money for this port or this hospital or what have you. And similar to that, there's an idea of something known as log rolling. This is basically, I'll vote for your bill if you vote for my bill. And so it's kind of that teamwork uh, where members of the House and the Senate, they vote for other people's legislation so that people vote for theirs. Getting back to money, there's two types of spending that Congress engages in, discretionary spending and mandatory spending. Now, discretionary spending, this is part of the annual budget. So every year, Congress gets to decide how much or how little to spend on certain things. So things like defense is the primary part of the discretionary budget. Education is another part, environmental. These are discretionary items on the budget. So Congress can choose each year how much to spend on those things. But that only makes up about 30% of the federal budget. The vast majority of federal spending, over 70% in fact, is known as mandatory spending. And this is spending that is required by law. So there is some law that Congress has passed in the past, and it says that they have to keep spending money on these things. Primary among mandatory spending programs are entitlement programs. These are programs that say that a person is entitled to a specific benefit by law, and then it says, all right, so now you need to provide that benefit. So we're thinking of things like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. These are the largest areas of entitlement spending, also the largest areas of mandatory spending, and in fact, the largest areas of federal spending overall. Now, there is a way to change mandatory spending, and that's through passing new legislation. However, this is often very difficult, especially with the filibuster rules as they currently are as of March of 2021. There is debate about changing those, obviously. But as it stands at this moment, it makes it very difficult to change these mandatory spending programs. And there is one additional part of mandatory spending, and that's interest on the national debt. Remember that the federal government pretty much every year spends more money than they receive in tax revenue, sometimes by like three or four trillion dollars, as crazy as that sounds. And because of that massive deficit, they have to borrow, right? And when you borrow money, you owe people that money plus interest. And so that interest on the debt is again required by law. It's something that Congress and the federal government has to pay for. And so that's part of that mandatory spending. So you can see where the increase in mandatory spending leads to it being tougher for Congress to have other money to spend on those discretionary items. All right, kind of switching gears a little bit, we have something known as party polarization. This is the idea of that increasing ideological division between the Democrats and the Republicans, where the Republicans are typically getting more conservative in the last few years and decades. The Democrats are becoming more liberal, so they're getting further and further apart from one another. That's going to lead to policy gridlock, less compromise. Um, it's slower, more difficult to get things passed. There's going to be more like tension, more filibusters, less compromise, all of those things, again, just making it tougher to get things done. We've also seen an increase in the amount of time that we have divided government. And this is where we're going to think of three things, the presidency, the House, and the Senate. Divided government is when at least one of those three is controlled by a different party. So you might have Democrats with the House and the Senate and then a Republican president, or a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, but a Republican House. That's divided government. When all three belong to the same party, as is currently the case in March of 2021, um, that's known as unified government. Now, there's a lot of pressures on members of Congress as far as how they're going to vote. Um, should they do what they personally think is best? Should they follow their constituents? Should they listen to interest groups? What should they do? So we have three models of congressional representation, trustee, delegate, and politico. The idea of being a trustee, this is when a person votes the way he or she thinks is best, regardless of what his or her constituents want. So even if their constituents think that they should vote no on a bill, if they think that they should vote yes, if they're acting as a trustee, then they would vote yes. A delegate, on the other hand, the delegate model says, okay, do what your constituents want, even if you disagree with it. 
And the Politico model of representation is you kind of do both. Sometimes you act as a delegate, sometimes you act as a trustee. So that would probably depend on the circumstances of that specific bill, how passionate the member of Congress was about that, or maybe how much attention that bill is getting in the public's eye. And last up, we come back to this idea of congressional representation. Now, specifically, we're thinking of, well, why does California have 53 members of the House and Florida has 27, etc.? And the answer is that this is done because of changes in population. We have something known as reapportionment. This is done every 10 years following the census, and those 435 seats in the House, they are redivided up depending on population shifts. So it's about relative population changes. If Florida's population is rising faster than, or Ohio's even falling, for example, uh, then Florida might gain a representative, Ohio might lose a representative. Now, once this takes place, now something happens called redistricting. And this is the job of state legislatures, and they now redraw their congressional maps. So if Florida goes from 27 to 28 members of the House, well, they need to redraw the map, right? Because they had 27 districts, now they need 28. Now, there are a couple of rules that we need to know about this, and so we might think about something called gerrymandering. In fact, there's a really good chance you've already heard of gerrymandering. We're talking about drawing districts in bizarre shapes. And when you're doing it to benefit a political party, that's known as partisan gerrymandering. And that's allowed. The Supreme Court says that that's okay. There is a type of gerrymandering that's not allowed, however. In Shaw versus Reno, one of your required cases, the Supreme Court ruled that racial gerrymandering is not allowed, even if the intention of that gerrymandering is to increase minority representation. And the other thing to keep in mind comes from your other required case in this section, which is Baker versus Carr. This is the case that famously led to the principle, one person, one vote. Basically what this means is there can't be any malapportionment. So you can't have districts of very unequal size. Everybody's vote is supposed to count about the same. We should have about the same amount of voting power when it comes to elections for the House of Representatives. Okay, that was a lot of information in this video. The congressional section of APGov is one of the most detailed, probably the most detailed section of APGov. So thank you for sticking with me. I really hope that it helped. And if it did, make sure to check out the next video about the executive branch. Until next time, this has been a La Money production. All right, thanks again for watching this video. Do me a favor, hit that like button for me. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Be sure to check out the Ultimate Review Packet. The link is in the description down below. Tons of great stuff there, study guides, review tests, practice, everything that you guys need to get ready for that AP exam or for your class. I'll see you guys in the next video.